Well, hello everyone. This is the Voxelab Aquila X2 3D printer, and after owning it for a few months, I feel confident making the claim that I can't imagine a better entry-level machine when you consider this product's relatively low cost. But it didn't show up looking like this. Instead, it came unassembled in a box like this. If we go ahead and open that up, we get a whole lot of small parts just clamoring to be assembled. That said, you should be prepared to spend a couple hours on it. The included instructions are actually very good. Often when it comes to import products, documentation is lacking. Uh, not here. The manufacturer really did a good job with both the details and the translation. So for that reason, I'm not going to get too far into the weeds regarding assembly in this video. However, I will run over the basic steps just in case anyone is trying to get a ballpark estimate of what they're getting themselves into by not purchasing a fully assembled machine. And it starts with this, the attachment of the two uprights to the partially assembled base. We then screw on the Z-axis stepper motor. This is one of several areas where you'll see that this is indeed a value price machine. More expensive ones will use dual motors here. Uh, it's now on to the uh, assembly of the XE axis, E standing for extruder. This portion of the build took me the longest as there are quite a few small parts. To actually install the extruder, I had to clamp the subassembly onto my desk because the shape made laying it flat otherwise impossible. Anyhow, once you get it situated, you'll also install the extruder drive belt and tensioner. Finally, this whole component slides on top of the two previously installed upright supports and is then further moved up and down by manually turning the Z-axis lead screw. The top is braced by a single piece of 2020 extruded aluminum that performs the triple task of holding a handle, acting as filament storage, and keeping the upright supports equally spaced. The last thing we need to work on before connecting electronics is the installation of the screen. Pretty easy, just a couple of screws attach a bracket to the back, and then that in turn is bolted to the frame. And now the fun part, plugging everything in. Voxelab makes this really easy by labeling everything. Here, for example, is the E4 extruder cord. After everything was theoretically assembled, the only thing that seemed a little off to me was the rigidity of the bed. There was noticeable play up and down. I thought this might be remedied by tightening the mounting screws holding it to the Y-axis support, as this is something that comes pre-assembled from the factory. So I took both the glass plate and heated bed off and sure enough found four screws holding it down. After tightening these up the problem was solved and there was now one last maintenance task left before we could print. Bed leveling. Truth being told, this process gets a little annoying. After printing for a while, you'll quickly find that a huge number of problems can be attributed to a misaligned bed. An auto-leveling bed is one feature that's present on higher-priced units that would really be nice to have. That said, because this is an open source design and basically a clone of the Creality Ender, many aftermarket solutions exist to add this functionality at a later date. Uh, in any case, to manually level, we use something very thin like a piece of paper or feeler gauge to evenly set the distance between the bed and the extruder nozzle tip. Basically, you'll just disable the stepper motors in the menu and then manually move the extruder and bed to each corner and use the adjustment screws to raise or lower it until the paper barely touches both surfaces. And now we're finally ready to print. Included in the accessory pack is a little sample quantity of translucent red PLA. It's really only enough to make some very small things. Since I was new to 3D printing, I just started off with one of the objects that is preloaded onto this unit's SD card. I literally didn't even know what I was printing when I hit start. Nevertheless, the machine jumped to life and started laying down filament for, um, something? Uh, right away, we can see a rectangle with rounded corners taking shape, but we'd still have to wait a couple of hours to see what we're now the proud owners of. Alright guys, it looks like my very first print is about to finish up here. The test file apparently made something that looks completely useless. Uh, I'll give you guys a closer look here in a minute, but I wanted to give you guys the uh, first person view of exactly what happens on the Voxelab Aquila, whatever version this is, C2. Uh, as it finishes a job. So this is running at about 1 hour 25 minutes. It's funny, uh, on the screen here, maybe I'll uh, give you guys a menu overview sometime in this video. Um, there's printing time and there's remaining time. The printing time just counts up. It's pretty straightforward. The remaining time bounces all over the place. It was anywhere from 
I think it's six point six minutes at one point to like I don't know thirteen hours or something. Oh, and then it just kind of goes to the back. Oh, all right. Well, let's move this thing forward. Come to me, my little thing. Well, I don't know, should I turn this thing off? I'm gonna turn it off and let the bed cool a little bit before I take it. So, yeah, the stock test print just basically makes a little trinket thing with some geometric shapes on them, presumably to demonstrate what this unit is capable of. Now, just because I was curious, I did take the time to break out my thermal camera during this print uh, session. I wanted to see how hot everything was getting, as well as look at how evenly the bed was heating. So, right about here, we're seeing about 170 degrees Fahrenheit on the Y-axis stepper, which seems to have the biggest workload as others aren't nearly as hot. The bed has about an 8 degree Fahrenheit difference between the center and extreme corners. This makes a lot of sense as the heating element doesn't cover the whole thing, instead relying on the excellent thermal conductivity of aluminum to distribute uh, somewhat evenly. Alright, I thought I'd just give you guys a little menu overview. These sort of look like they'd be touch sensitive, but they're not. It's just controlled with this little rotary dial here. First option, print, will just allow you to choose a, a G-code file. Um, over here in control, this is kind of where you basically can manually control the bed. Um, so if you want to just manually move it, you can manually you know, just, you know, select a value there. It's in millimeters, so if you want to manually move it around, you can do that. Uh, right here, your disable stepper. Uh, that's what you'll need to do to bed level it. So uh, again, disable it and then you can freely move things around. Auto home will return everything to its uh, original position. So you know, I just kind of jogged everything around and now we want to get it set. So you also want to always auto home it before you bed level it. So try that. Maybe that's to complete that Z move I just did a uh, second ago before it. There we go. So now it's just gonna kinda drop everything till it hits those home switches. Uh, set your home offsets. I've never really changed those. I'll probably have to uh, mess with these things when I uh, install a bed leveler. Preheat PLA is really useful. I actually use that a lot uh, before I run a G-code file. A lot of times your G-code files, they'll uh, warm up your bed and your extruder separately. This will warm them up simultaneously, which definitely saves some time getting a print started. Um, over here in your settings, I basically have everything stock. I didn't really change much. Um, your temperature, you can manually warm up the uh, bed. Or you can reset your preheat temperatures. Uh, your motion here. Um, I usually just do this through G-code, but it basically just allows you to hit uh, hard limits on your motion speed. Filament detection. I was really happy to see this on that unit, although I've found that you use far less filament than you usually think you will, so I've actually never run out of filament on a print. Um, yeah, language and reset, don't really mess with that. Uh, info, and that just kind of gives you your form firmware versions. So. Uh, there's not a whole lot in the menu, but there is really enough uh, to run the basics of the machine. So overall, and again considering the price, I couldn't be happier with the purchase. After filming the unboxing and assembly portion of this video, I didn't get around to putting it together for a few months. In the meantime, I just kept coming up with genuinely useful things to make. For example, in this video, I'm making a little bracket to mount a hairdryer when not in use. Here, I'm making a set of Christmas stocking clips that snap onto my mantle. In this print, I'm trying out PETG for its greater heat resistance and making a custom brake controller mount for my car dash. And finally, this one is a custom designed mounting block so that my compost bin can store on the side of my trash can. All this said, it's not perfect and in some ways it's obvious that it's a value priced machine. For one, it's actually pretty loud at about 65 or 66 decibels. 
That doesn't sound like a ton, but it gets annoying when it's right next to you for hours. In the future, I'll probably get around to upgrading the fan, installing a self-leveling sensor, and perhaps upgrading the bed with a PEI magnetic sheet. The beauty here is that because it's an Ender clone, upgrades are plentiful. So overall, a really great entry-level printer.